Hello again. As you know, I'm Eli the Computer Guy over here for Everyman IT. Today's class is understanding SOHO uh, routers. So, so there are routers and then there are, there are what are called SOHO routers or small office home office routers. Um, basically, uh, what you should understand is that um, normal routers Normal routers only basically do one thing, and all they do is they route traffic between different subnets. So if you don't know what a subnet is, you're going to have to go and take the TCP IP uh, class, understanding TCP IP. But basically, all a normal router does is route traffic between different subnets. That's it. Pretty simple. Well, the thing is, normal big routers uh, do a lot of routing between different subnets. So you may have one router handling, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 different uh, types of communication over that router. Well, when you have a small office, uh, you don't need all that power just to do routing because you know you've only got four or five computers in the office. So what the what companies have done, like uh, like Cisco here and Linksys and Juniper and all that is they came up with Soho uh, routers. Now what these Soho routers do is they combine multiple logical devices into one physical device. So if you were dealing with a normal Cisco router, basically you would have one box like this and it would have two ports on it and that is it. And all it would do is route traffic between two different subnets. Well, if you buy a Soho router from, like I say, Cisco or Linux or Linksys or one of those, this has multiple logical devices inside. So not only is it a router, so it routes between two subnets, but it's also a, also a switch. So this is a switch, so you can connect up to four computers onto this Soho uh, router. On top of that, it has a firewall inside. Some of them have VPN connections. Basically, these things do, uh, or basically have a lot more functionality than a normal router does. Because like I say, a normal router, like a Cisco enterprise class router, all it does is route information between two between different subnets, but it routes a whole bunch of information between different subnets. Soho routers, eh, they don't deal with so much information, and so they can put a lot of different services on here. So again, you'll have a DHCP server on here, DNS server on here, firewall server on here, the whole nine yards. So this class is on Soho routers. Um, you know, th this, is, this is simple stuff. Soho routers, really, 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 it's simple stuff. You know, don't, don't think this is uber complicated. I know you've probably seen like the CCNA, Cisco Certified Network Administrator uh, certification. You think routers, oh my golly, routers. Dude, routers are simple. Uh, just, just watch this class, go out, buy some stupid little Linksys or Netgear router, play with it. And that's really all you need to know to, to understand how to administer Soho routers that you're going to be using in the average home or office with up to 50 users. I mean, an office with 50 users can use this $200 Soho router right here. They don't have to have a $5,000 Cisco router. So, uh, so give me a second and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into Soho routers. So in the introduction, I, we talked a little bit about the difference between enterprise class routers and Soho routers. So Soho routers are small office, home office routers. If you go out you know, to Newegg.com or go to Best Buy and you're, you're looking through um, you know, all the different networking equipment, whether it's routers, whether it's wireless access points, whether it's switches, any network equipment, most of the time uh, they, they break the networking equipment into three classes. There's residential, class, which is the lowest level, the cheapest level uh, type of networking gear, you know, whether it's routers, wireless access points or switches. Basically, they pump it out cheap because uh, quality eh, don't matter so much. Then you have enterprise, which is really expensive. It's 10 times as expensive as the residential equipment, uh, but it has to work all the time. Like I say, if you buy a Cisco switch, this is this is a brick. I mean, you're you're gonna plug it in, and the thing is gonna work until it's obsolete. I mean, that's that's really how Cisco stuff is. Uh, but then you have the middle ground of the people that need more reliability. Uh, than the residential stuff, you know, they need it working 99% of the time, uh, but they don't need it working 100% of the time. So they're willing to, to cost cut a little bit uh, and, and get just slightly less quality. And that's where, where Soho equipment comes in. So again, if you're dealing with offices of 10 to 20 people, you may look at Soho networking equipment as, as something that, that will be useful. Because again, um, it's, it's more, it's better quality than residential, less quality than enterprise, but it's also 
it's not a, not going to cost you an arm and a leg. You know, a, a Soho 48 port switch uh, will cost you eight nine hundred dollars uh, versus an Enterprise 48 port switch is going to cost you fifteen hundred to two thousand um, dollars. The other thing that, that makes Soho equipment um, better for, for most consultants or most uh, small IT shops versus enterprise equipment is the fact that almost all of the Soho equipment is web GUI uh, administrable. So basically, you, you, you open up a web browser, you go to the IP address of the networking equipment, and you can configure the networking equipment through a little web interface. Uh, versus enterprise stuff, almost any of the enterprise stuff, you're actually going to have to go into like Cisco, the CLI, where you're going to, to have to type out these DOS-like commands in a terminal prompt. Um, the thing is, uh, doing those DOS-like commands, it, it's much more solid, much more secure, but you and your employees are going to have a much larger uh, learning curve. Uh, to, to, to deal with that. To be honest with you, when I was running Eli the Computer Guy, the repair shop, uh, although we use Cisco wireless access points, try to use Cisco switches, most of the time I found it was better not to use the Cisco routers because, again, with seven employees, the learning curve was too steep. Uh, you know, we used business class Soho Linksys gear because you could train somebody on that in a couple of hours versus, like I say, with, with Cisco stuff. Oh, I mean, that, 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 that's a couple of days just worth of, worth of training. So, so that's the difference between, like I say, Soho and Enterprise. Soho is a little bit better, or it's a lot better than residential, a little bit worse uh, than Enterprise equipment. And then the, the other thing that is big is, like I say, the Soho equipment, uh, you're going to be able to administer it through a web GUI interface, you know, a graphical interface. Whereas when you get the Enterprise stuff, uh, you're opening up a terminal prompt and you're, you're typing in a bunch of commands. So, so that, that's the big difference between Soho and uh, Enterprise. Now, since this is basically a, an introductory router class, we're not, we're not going to go into um, insane configurations with routers. Uh, at the end of this, we're going to go over two examples, and I'll, and I'll draw out for you how you may expect to use multiple routers in a small office or small business configuration. But basically, we're, we're going to assume you have a very, very simple configuration. Like I say, router, routers can be insane. You can have you know, just thousands of routers all doing wacky stuff. But, but you know, for the small office, for you, we're, we're, we're not going not gonna to worry about that. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is your external IP address or how people are going to get uh, to your internal network from the outside world. So if you have the internet cloud up here, and then you have your router, and then you have, you know, your equipment, you know, whatever else is below this. So basically, you know, when you have a router, when you're dealing with small businesses or small organizations, there is a good chance you are going to be hosting uh, stuff on your internal network. So you may you may have a web server here, you know, like Eli the, or uh, Everyman IT. We 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 host a, one of our web servers straight in this building here. Uh, you may have something called a small business server, a Microsoft small business server, uh, that allows you know people to get VPN access or virtual private network access into the network. Uh, you may have a telephone server or an email server. Uh, that that's probably a big one. You know, if you if you have the small business server or an exchange server, you, you know. Basically, the email has to actually get from the internet all the way down to the, this, this email server. So the, the first and probably the best way uh, to deal with your external IP address is to buy a static IP address. Static. So what this means is when you go with a Comcast business class internet or if you buy T1 service or you get a DSL business class uh, internet, Sometimes they give it to you, and sometimes you have to pay an extra $10 a month, but it's worth it. A static IP address. So basically, they give you an IP address like 207.88.44.22. They give you this static IP address, and you always have this IP address. Always, 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 always. So basically, as long as you have the service, this is the IP address uh, that you have. Now, as, as you should know at this point, taking this class, 
all TCP IP networking is based on IP addresses. So as far as the internet world is concerned, this IP address is you. So if you have a static one, this is the best thing to have. Now, if you try to go cheaper, the problem is, is they will give you something called a dynamic IP address. And this means your IP address for the outside world uh, changes every once in a while. It may change once a week, it may change once a month, it may change once a year. But basically, every once in a while, that IP address is going to change. Now, when that IP address changes, that can cause a lot of havoc on, on your network if people are trying to get in. Because remember, when people try to, to get to that email server, uh, they use an MX rec, something called an MX record. That MX record has to point to an IP address. So if it points to a dynamic IP address and then the IP address changes, well now it's pointing to the wrong IP address. So you are no longer going to get your email. Uh, you know, if you have a web server and the, 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 the DNS is pointed uh, to this dynamic IP address and then the dynamic IP address changes, now your web server goes offline. Now, if you have a static IP address and it always stays the same, then you don't have to worry about these problems. This really is, this is a really, really big deal. So I would suggest um, with you guys out there that pay the extra $10 or whatever it is for a static IP address. Remember, all the traffic from the outside world that is coming to your router or to your internal network has to go to an IP address. Uh, if you have a static one, like I said, it'll always be the same and therefore you don't have to worry about changing configurations. If you use a dynamic IP address, you know, you're trying to save 10, 15 bucks a month. Well, whenever that dynamic IP address changes, that means you have to go and you have to change all of these different records out on the internet. Your MX record, your WWW record, your, your C name record, your A record, etc. So the main thing is when you're dealing with a router is that the external port right here, can either be configured you know, for a dynamic IP address or for a static IP address. What you want is a static IP address right here. Now the next, uh, or well I guess the first service that we're going to talk about that your Soho router will provide for your network is something called DHCP. Now, as we talked about, every piece of networking equipment uh, has to have an IP address. So if you have computers on your network, they all have to have IP addresses to, to work on the network. So there's two ways uh, you can give your computers IP addresses. Like we just talked about, you can either give them static IP addresses. This means you go into every single computer and you specifically state what IP address it has. So this one has 192.168.1.2. Two, this is dot three, this is 192.168.1.5. And so you actually go in and every single computer, you, you give an IP address and you set up the network configurations. Obviously, if you're dealing with a large network, that is a complete pain in the butt because it means you literally have to sit down at every single computer uh, and type in that IP address. With DHCP, Basically, the router can automatically assign IP addresses to the computers. So when this computer connects to the network, uh, it will ask for an IP address and the router will give it the IP address. So it'll say you're 192.168.1.40. And then when this computer asks for an IP address, it'll give it the IP address and et cetera. So it'll keep giving out IP addresses. Now the main thing uh, that you have to remember uh, when you're dealing with the DHCP is that the, 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 the router will give out the DHCP addresses from the pool that it has. So basically within uh, the configuration for your router, you can state what range of IP addresses uh, you want that router to give out. So let's say you have an office with let's say 25 uh, computers. You know, people may come in, people may come out. So what you could say for this DHCP router is you want this router to give out addresses 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.200. So what this means is that, that this router will give out IP addresses 
between 100 to 200. So it won't give out an address 192.168.1.1. It won't give out that address. And it won't give out an address 192.168.1.250. It will only give out addresses 192.168.1.100 through 200. Why this is very important is because uh, when we get into port forwarding in a second, some devices on your network and servers should always have a static IP address. So uh, your servers, like I say, if you have an email server, if you have a web server, if you have a VPN, virtual private network server, these servers should always have a static IP address. Again, I'm going to tell you why in a minute when we go into port forwarding. Now here's the thing. You don't want this router accidentally giving another computer on the network the same IP address as one that your server or your networking equipment has. So let's say your email server has the, the, the IP address 192.168.1.5, right? If this router accidentally gives another computer on the network that the 192.168.1.5 IP address, when email traffic comes in and it's supposed to get routed to that email server, there's going to be problems because it's going to see two dot five addresses and you know sometimes it'll go to this computer and sometimes it'll go to the email server and sometimes it'll just all go to hell. So basically the main thing with this pool is you want to make sure that the, 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 the router is not handing out IP addresses for uh, computers that have static IP addresses. You know, so for me, I normally say, like I say, 100 to 200 is good. 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.200 to is usually a good range to give because like I say, is, is if this, the router gives out an IP address for, for a server to somebody else, it's, it, it's all just bad. The other thing to remember with DHCP, DHCP servers, uh, ju just, just as a heads up, because a lot of, I know a lot of you guys are newbies, a lot of times when you have a small network, you will let the router be the DHCP server. Well, once you start getting real servers on the network, uh, you normally want those servers to handle being the DHCP server. So you want the server to hand out the DHCP addresses, especially, like I say, once you start getting a little bit a little bit bigger networks like small business server. So a Windows small business server does a lot of stuff. It does, like I say, it does a VPN server, it does the email server, it does a web server, it does a whole bunch of stuff in one little box. Well, when you configure that Windows small business server, it should be the DHCP server and the DNS server all in, in one little box, right? Here's the weird thing. If you turn a router on as a DHCP server, if you plug this into the network, that Windows small business server DHCP will automatically turn off. I don't know why, it's a weird little configuration quirk. But basically, if you accidentally put two servers on the network trying to handle, hand out DHCP addresses, you can cause a lot of problems. So, so just keep that in mind. If you're dealing with Windows servers or if you have another DHCP server on the network, make sure you turn off the DHCP server on this router uh, before you plug it into the rest of the network because if this comes online, there's a good chance it'll shut off the other DHCP uh, router uh, or server. Like I say, as I've talked about in the past, you know, I've made a lot, of, a lot of money off of stupid things like this. I mean, I've literally made thousands of dollars off of somebody plugging in a stupid little Linksys uh, router onto the network. That little Linksys router has a DHCP server. When that DHCP server comes online, it kicks the Windows real server DHCP server offline. It's, it's just one of those things. So that's, but DHCP, all this is, the server on here, is it automatically assigns IP addresses to the client computers on the network. And again, you have the, what's called the DHCP scope. And this is where you tell it what range you want uh, to give the IP addresses. So like I say, 192.168.1 to 100 to 200. Now, along with the DHCP server services that your router will have, your router will always, almost always also have DNS services, so DNS. Now, that all DNS server is, is, or DNS is, is a domain name service or domain name server. What this does is this turns computer names into IP addresses. So basically, when you have a computer on the network that's looking for PC1, right? 
that computer will ask the router what the IP address of PC1 is. The router will say the IP address is 192.168.11.40 and then this computer will say okay thank you and then it will use that IP address to contact the computer called PC1. Now uh, as you should know uh, or, or as you'll learn you know doing networking remember uh, computers on the, the TCP IP network all they really care about are TCP IP network addresses. Uh, things like names like PC1 or PC2 or server or such. These names that we call computers, the computers really don't care about. They care about the IP address. So what you have is you have the DNS server that hands out the IP address uh, when a computer asks you know, what the name corresponds to. So basically the first computer says, hey, what is the IP address for PC1? Your server will say the IP address is XYZ, you know, 192.168.1.40, and then this computer will then use that IP address to actually talk to the other computer. Again, uh, there's usually within these routers not a whole lot you can configure for DNS. We'll have a whole class on, on DNS servers because when you're dealing with a real DNS server, there are a lot of configurations you can do. There's a lot of cool stuff, but normally when you're dealing with Soho routers, there, there's not much you can do with it. Basically, the DNS server is either on or the DNS server is off. That's all there is. But it's good to know that on top of the DHCP service where they hand out IP addresses, these routers also act as name servers. So probably one of the most important things to understand about the Soho uh, routers is port forwarding. So what port forwarding does is it tells the router to forward specific types of traffic to a specific computer on the internal network. So let's say we have a web server, right? So we have, you know, www web server. And this web server, the internal IP address is 192.168.1. Let's say 10. Okay. So this is the internal web server. So this is the web server that runs the website for your company. So you have a company, um, you want people to be able to get to this web server that's sitting on your internal network. So we have a computer out here and we need to get to this web server. All port forwarding does is, again, as you should know by now, or as you'll learn at this point, all types of, of internet traffic use different ports. So, so you have, you know, you have your normal IP address, right? 192.168.1.40. And then you have a port, colon 80. So port 80 is the web server port. Uh, you have port 25, port 21, you have, you have lots and lots of ports. Every single service that works on the internet uses a different port. You know, uh, you have a port for, for web services, HTTP, you have a port for email services, you have a port for FTP, you have a port for Skype, you have a port for digital surveillance systems, you have a port for voice over IP. Every single different service on the internet uh, has a port that corresponds to it. So. What happens is in your router, if you have, let's say, a web server, all you do is in the configuration, you say, if anything comes in for port 80, it should be sent to 192.168.1.10. So basically, if anything comes in for this particular port, it will automatically get forward to this computer on the internal network. It's that simple. So, so if you have a web server here and you want port 80 forwarded to it, uh, you just say, you know, port 80 gets forwarded to 192.168.1.100. Now, if you have uh, over here, let's say you have your email server. Oh, is it port 25? I think it's port 25. Let's say it's on port 25. Let's imagine, let's believe it's on port 25. And then, so what you say is if email comes in, if somebody sends email, you want port 25 to go over to 192.168.1.11. So when email comes in, it will get routed over here. So basically, if somebody's out, you know, they're trying to get to your website, they will get routed to your web server. If they're trying to send you an email, that will get routed to your, your email server. It's, it's really that simple, it's dirt simple. Um, what you have to know is that if you're going to have a server on your internal network, you have to know 
what ports it uses. So, so that's the big thing. Um, you know, you just do a little Google search. Like I said, if you do small business server, you have to forward about five ports to that small business server. Um, but, but that's really all there is to it. Is so, like I say, is if you if you do email, like I say I think it's port 25. You would just say port 25 gets forwarded to this IP address. If it's web it gets forwarded to this IP address. If you have a voice over IP phone system, it would get forwarded over to another IP address. The main thing with port forwarding though, is all these servers that you have on your internal network need a static IP address. So they cannot get their IP addresses from DHCP. You have to hard code these, these IP addresses into the server. So this web server will always be 192.168.1.10. This email server will always be 192.168.1.11 always 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 but as long as you understand that it's, it's pretty simple so like I say every service on the internet Skype um, video uh, uh, you know all, all the services use different ports all you do is if you have a server running on your internal network you just say you know port 80 gets shipped over to this static IP address if you do that like I say it's it's dirt simple Okay, now um, most Soho routers also have a firewall built into them. So what a firewall does is it blocks traffic on, your, on specific ports on your router so that hackers cannot try to hack into your network. So if all the ports are open on your router, uh, there, there's a chance that, that a hacker could get into your network and then just, just hack your network. So basically all a firewall does is block ports. So. Uh, so what you can do is if you're worried about hackers on your router, uh, you know, hackers trying to get into your internal network, you can just block, you could say all the ports, you could say I want to block all the ports so I don't have to worry about hackers getting into the network, and then you can open specific ports that you want open. So if you have a web server, you could say I want to open port 80. If you have an email server, I want to open port uh, 25. It's basically that simple. All a firewall does, oops, all a firewall does is block the ports uh, on your router so hackers can't try to get into it. The main thing that you have to remember about this is most of the time the firewall blocks both incoming and outgoing uh, traffic. So if you block port 80, right? You say, I'm worried about hackers, I want to block port 80. Well, there's a good chance that the computers on your internal network also will not be able to use a, a web service. So if they try to go out to CNN.com, it won't work because you have blocked port 80. So with most of these Soho routers, um, if you block a port, it's both incoming and outgoing. So again, if you block port 80, that means your web services are not going to work. If you block port 25, it means nobody can send email, etc. So be very, 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 very careful with a firewall on Soho routers and make sure you understand either what you need or what your client needs. Um, frankly, I used to be very lenient with the firewalls on the Soho routers that I set up because so many of my clients did so many weird things. Um, you know, they may only want uh, their their employees uh, to use, you know, the web, go to websites and get email, but then they themselves may use all this wacky stuff. So they would be using Skype and they'd be using Instant Messenger and all of that. Well, if you if you block the ports for Instant Messenger and you block the ports for Skype, then the owner of the company also can't use Skype. So that that that's where you have to be careful. If you turn on the firewall sitting in uh, the router, like I say, not only are you protecting from the internet, but you could be protecting uh, you know, people from being able to get out to the things that they, they need to get to. Be very, very, very careful uh, with, with, with the firewall. The other thing to remember too is most, uh, most Soho routers, the firewall, firewall rule takes precedence over port forwarding. So if you say block all, right? But then you still have this web server over here and you port forward over to that web server. Well, that block all is going to take precedence. And so people are still not going to be able to get to your web server because the firewall is blocking all port 80 traffic. 
see how that works. So, so be careful with this. Some, some Soho routers, if you do port forwarding, it will automatically open the appropriate ports in the firewall. Most of them though, like I say, firewall rules take precedence. If you say block everything in the firewall rule, uh, then, then, then that's, that's going to block everything. Um, firewalls, Probably the, the the biggest thing that I've seen that takes down networks uh, that 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 you know small new new consultants start playing with because like I say they start thinking hey I'm going to make the make the network so much more secure so I'm going to block everything other than port 80 port 25 and port 21 again. Skype uses a different port. You know, all these other services, Instant Messenger uses a different port. So they block all these ports and then all of a sudden Instant Messenger isn't working, Skype isn't working, all these things aren't working. So you have to be very, very careful uh, with setting the firewall. All it does is block the ports, but if you, if you block the wrong ports, you can cause more problems than frankly the hackers are gonna cause. Now the next thing to talk about is something called port triggering. And yes, I, I think I just said about everything I need to say about port triggering. Um, port triggering is a service that, that's available on all Soho routers. Um, it's kind of like an automatic version of port forwarding, but I'm not going to talk about it because I don't think I have ever used it in 12 years. I do not believe I've ever used port triggering in 12 years of technology. So. Um, I think it will just confuse the situation if I talk about it anymore. So basically, if you find out that you need to do port triggering, um, you know, just do a little Google search on it. It's not that complicated, but otherwise just stay the hell away from it. I don't think I have ever, ever, ever used port triggering. And so, uh, yeah, so we'll just, that, that's all that needs to be said about port triggering. Now before uh, we go to the whiteboard and I do some examples, uh, schematics of how you can, can you know, put routers together, uh, I want to talk about something. I want to talk about redundancy. So one of the reasons uh, almost all of my clients got this specific series of Linksys business class router is because it offered internet redundancy. So with this particular uh, model right here, you could plug in up to four different internet connections so that if any single one failed, the office would still be on the internet. So you could plug Comcast into one, you could plug DSL into another, and you could plug, I don't know, clear that whole Wi-Fi thing into another. And so if any one of those internet connections failed, uh, then, then, then you are still on the internet. Uh, you know, this is something you just have to look at the different features uh, of what you know different routers have. But like I say, this, this per, uh, particular series, it's the RV016. Um, they have four port versions, eight port switch versions, and this the 16 port guy. Like I say, the nice part is, and something to think about, is that it offers redundancy. Now the internet has become so inexpensive. I mean, Comcast business class internet in my area is $60. Uh, Verizon business class internet is $30. So basically for $100 a month, you can have a redundant internet connection, which, you know, like I say, is once you start dealing with real businesses, businesses with 10 or 20 people, $100 a month is a pittance compared to what happens if Comcast goes down for a day or what happens if Verizon goes down for a day. So uh, so something to think about with, with, with your clients, you know, like I say I'd highly suggest it, is at least with these Linksys series and a few of the other Soho series, you can have redundant internet connections. So again, like I say, if, if one of the connections fails, you're still on the internet, you, you're still doing business. Okay, since we've talked about you know, routers and what they do, uh, I figured I'd just do uh, two examples of how you can use multiple routers in a normal small organization configuration. Like I say, is if you're dealing with the enterprise, you may have 100 routers, you may have 1,000 routers, and they're all doing wacky, amazing things. But you know, if you're dealing with 10 or 20 person office, uh, you, you don't need 20 routers. You, you may need one or two or, or four if you're doing something really fancy, but, but that, that's really all you need to do. Uh, now, the first example that we're going to go over is something called a DMZ. So a DMZ is something is called a demilitarized zone. Uh, we went over this in the uh, physical network segmentation class, but we'll talk about it a little more here uh, to, so, so you get a better idea of what's going on. So with a DMZ, the idea is you're using one single internet connection, but you want two levels of security. So you want part of your network that doesn't have very much security on it at all, and then you want another part of your network that has a lot of security. 
So you have your little internet cloud up here, right? And then it comes down, and this is your internet connection, and this is your router. This is your first router. So underneath this first router, uh, you may need this DMZ for any number of reasons. Let's say you have web services uh, that you want to present to the internet. So you have, uh, you want your clients to be able to come to your web server that's sitting on your internet connection. Well, uh, you want everybody to get into that web server, but if that web server gets hacked, you don't want that web server to be able to attack all the client computers and other servers uh, that you have on your network. So that's the first reason you could have a DMZ here. The other reason, uh, the reason, frankly, uh, that I always use for my clients is let's say you have a business and you want to give uh, your customers wireless access or access to the internet. So, uh, so you want to put a little wireless access point here. And then let's say you're a cafe or a swim club or, or something like that. You want to give your, your members uh, ability to use your internet connection. Again, you want to give them the ability uh, to use your internet connection, but you don't want them to be able to hack your network. So basically, this first router here, uh, you know, is pretty open. You know, no, really no firewall rules. Anything can get in and out. Well, what happens is then you have a switch underneath this router. And then into the switch, you connect all the, the devices that you want in this DMZ. So you want the wireless access point, you want the web server, et cetera. So, so these things are out, you know, they're behind a router, they're slightly secure, but they're not very secure. Then underneath this, you have your second router, router two, and this is the one uh, that is most secure. So basically this is the Uber, you know, the big router, because under here, you have your Active Directory servers, you have your email servers, you have your, I don't know, your VPN servers. So these are the servers that you do not want to get hacked. You know, if the web server gets hacked, uh, it's a pain in the butt, but you can deal with it. If your Active Directory server gets hacked, uh, you're screwed. <laughs> so you want your Active Directory server uh, to be secure. And then beyond that, you have all your other client computers uh, down here. So basically, in order to make this work, it, it's pretty simple. So you have this one router here and you're not gonna turn on any firewall rules. The, what you are gonna use though is what we talked about before is port forwarding, right? So what you're going to tell it is you're gonna say anything coming in for port 80, port 80 is the HTTP port. So this is the port that, that, uh, that websites use, right? So any port, any, Anything coming in from the internet using port 80 is going to go to this web server. So you're going to put in the static IP address of this web server, 192.168.2.2, let's say, right? So this is 192. This web server is 192.168.2.2. So everything goes there. Then what you're going to say is, like I say, for, for the secure network, you have email servers, you have VPN, etc. So let's say you're using port 25, you're using port 21 and uh, port 47, is that right? Port 47 for VPN? Now, what you're then going to say is this, your router number two's outbound side IP address will be 192.168.2.3, let's say. So what you'll say to this router is route port 25, port 21, and port 47 to 192.168.2.3. Now, the external IP address of this router uh, is 192.168.2.3. The internal IP address of this router does have to be a different subnet. Remember, routers route between two different subnets. So if you use 192.168.2.3 on this side, you're going to have problems. It's, it's not going to work properly. So you need the in side IP address of the router to be a different subnet. So for router two, we would do 192.168.1. Let's say one. So the external IP address of router two is 192.168.2.3. The internal IP address is a different subnet, 192.168.1.1. Now in router two, you're going to configure and you're going to say port 25 goes to the email server. And then you'll say port 47 goes to the VPN server. And I don't know, port 21 or whatever goes to the Active Directory server. So what happens is in this first router, 
you're going you're gonna to split off. So you'll say port 80 goes to this server that's sitting in the DMZ. But for all this other stuff, you know, for your VPN connection, for your email and all that, I want all of those sent to the external IP address of router number 2, 192.168.2.3. Then inside of router number two, you're going to split all those ports to wherever they need to go. Again, port 47 will go to VPN, uh, port 25 will go to email, port 21 goes to, to wherever it goes to. This is basically how the DMZ works. Then uh, on router number two, you have that firewall. And basically, you then get to decide how secure you want it to be. If you want it to be really secure, then you lock down all the ports other than the ports that you need to have open. Uh, if you want it to be less secure, well, you make it less secure. But the main thing is, is, is with the DMZ is that router number one, you know, it's going to have an IP address out, an external IP, static IP address, you know, 207.1.1.1, I guess. The internal IP address of it will be 192.168.2.1. Um, and so, you know, traffic, when traffic comes in, it'll come here, it'll look for the, the port forwarding, it'll get forwarded to wherever it needs to go. Then if it goes down to router number two, then it gets forwarded uh, to the, the appropriate, um, appropriate servers. The only final thing uh, then to remember is the default gateway. Uh, let's see if we have this. Default gateway. So to make sure that you configure the default gateway correctly. Again, if you don't understand what the default gateway is, uh, go please take the TCP IP class. That'll explain this. But basically the default gateway states where do you go and where does a computer look if it can't find uh, what it's looking for on the local network. So here for the VPN server and the email server, the Active Directory server and all the computers, the default gateway would be 192.168.1.1 because that's the internal IP address of router number two. What you have to remember to do in router number two though is the default gateway for router number two will be 192.168.2.1. So all these computers here, default gateway will be router two. Router 2's default gateway will be Router 1. And then all everything sitting in the DMZ's default gateway will be Router 1. Uh, again, pretty simple, but just make sure, don't, don't screw up. If you, if you make this email server's uh, default gateway, this router up here, uh, it, it just won't work. So you, you have to, to make it you know, the, the closest possible router. Hope all that made, mess made a lot of sense. But that, that's the first example of, of what a DMZ is. Now the next example uh, that, that, that we'll talk about uh, is, is again something that you will probably see uh, that you can actually sell in the outside world. And that is where you have, let's say you have one building and you need to share one internet connection among multiple businesses. So, uh, so basically you have the internet connection up here and then right, you know, when it comes into the building, you have your internet modem. So whether this is a DSL modem, whether it's a Comcast modem, an AdTran, et cetera. Well, one of the things most people don't realize is on a single internet connection, you can get multiple IP addresses. So multiple external IP addresses. And remember, an external IP address is, is, is what the outside world, uh, the only thing that the outside world cares about for you. So let's say you have three businesses, one, uh, one two, and three. And so you can buy for an extra 10 or $15 a month additional IP addresses. So let's say you want to have IP address 207.55.4.1, 207.55.4.2, and 207.55.4.3. So you're going to use the first IP address for your first business, the second IP address for your second business, and the third IP address for your third business. Now since these are static external IP addresses, that means the first business can point all of their email traffic, all their web traffic, etc to this external IP address. The second business can point all their traffic to the second IP address, and the third business can point all their traffic to the third IP address. So all these three IP addresses come in to this one, this, this one modem, like I say, whether it's DSL or Comcast or, uh, or AdTran, whatever. Now what you're gonna do is underneath this modem, you're gonna have a little network cable, and you're gonna plug this in to a four port switch. You're not gonna plug it into a router. You're going to plug it into a switch. So you have the connection coming in from the internet that goes to the modem, and then that modem is going to go to the switch. Now what's gonna happen 
is off this switch, you are going to put three separate routers. Now this router's external IP address will be 207.55.4.1, this will be .4.2, and this will be .4.3. So now, if email traffic comes in for company one, it will go to 207.55.4.1. Now here, you can configure all your port forwarding and all your firewall and anything you want. You know, if somebody's going to uh, company number two, they go to the second IP address and it will automatically get routed to the second IP address. So the main thing to remember is one internet connection. So you know one subscription to Comcast Business Class Internet. You can have multiple IP addresses. Each business then can have its own static IP address and basically all you do is you plug in a switch past the modem and then you plug the routers in and now everybody here can do uh, whatever they want. So, so business number one can have an email server and a web server, business number two they only have internet access and business number three is some weird geeky company that does everything in the world. None of these companies can hack each other. They can't, they can't loop back into each other. They all get their own services. It's, it's just a very good thing. And so this is something that you may run into, into the real world. So the main thing to remember is internet, a single internet connection, you can have multiple static IP addresses. If you do that, like I say, you just run the modem into a switch and then you run multiple routers into that switch. Again, you know, this has one IP address, this has the next IP address, this has the next IP address. Um, like I say, th th this works fabulously and um, yeah, it's just, a, it's a very good thing. So that was a class on Soho routers. Um, like I say, if you're, if you're absolutely brand new to this, uh, this may seem a little bit over your head, you do have to understand TCP IP uh, to understand how routers work because routers route TCP IP. So if you don't understand TCP IP, then you don't really understand routers. Uh, we talked about the difference between residential, Soho, and enterprise class routers. Uh, you know, as I always say, always, 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 don't use residential equipment for a business. Don't, 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 don't. It is not worth it. It's, it's not. Uh, Soho equipment, like I say, is better quality than residential equipment, but not as good as enterprise. So you're going to pay more for it than you will residential equipment, but you'll pay less than enterprise equipment always buy Soho uh, business class equipment. Like I say, even if it's Linksys, Linksys has business class Soho equipment. Um, the main difference, uh, you know, if you're thinking, hey, my client has more than enough money, I could buy the enterprise stuff, class stuff, is the Soho equipment is going to have a nice web GUI interface that, that basically any 13-year-old will be able to administer. You know, I love Cisco. Cisco is great stuff but you have to understand how to administer it. You know, you have to open up a terminal and, and configure this, you know, using basically DOS prompts, which, um, you know, that's, that, that can be a little more difficult uh, to train people on. Uh, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, with, with your router, you'll, you'll have your, your external IP address, and if, so people from the outside world can get in uh, to your internal LAN, to your local area network. We talked about that there's static, and we talked about that there's dynamic IP addresses. Again, if you're running a business, just pay the extra 10 bucks and get a static IP address. Um, remember, if you have email servers running, if you have web servers running, etc., the internet only cares about that IP address. So if you have a dynamic IP address and that IP address changes, that means all your servers basically aren't doing anything and until you go in and, and change configurations. Not a good thing. I talked about the DHCP. So these little, these little routers now, you know, like I say, they, they, a router actually doesn't do a lot. So these routers are actually, they, they, they combine a lot more than just routing. One of the services they combine is the DHCP, so they automatically hand out IP addresses to the local area network. We talked about scope. Make sure to restrict the scope of the IP addresses that, that the router is giving out so that it doesn't give out IP addresses that are already being used by servers or equipment uh, in your network. Uh, we also talked about, also be careful, is if you have a real server on the network providing DHCP services. Like I say, I've seen this time and time and time again, and I've made a lot of money off this. People plug in a, a, a router that offers DHCP services. This trumps the, the server that's supposed to be uh, giving DHCP service, and that server will actually turn itself off. 
and it just turns into a complete mess. Uh, along with DHCP, these little guys also provide DNS services, so domain name services. Um, usually there's not a lot you can do with a domain name service. Uh, it's basically either on or it's off. We talked about port forwarding. So every single service uh, on the internet requires its own port, you know, port 80, port 25, port 21, port 47, etc. So basically all you do with port forwarding is if you have a server on your network that's, that's providing a service to the internet, you just tell the router, you know, if you have a web server, anything coming in on port 80 gets directed to this static IP address. It's that simple. Firewalls. All a firewall does, really simple, basically, is it blocks ports. So the idea is if you block ports, hackers won't be able to hack into your network. The problem is, is like I say, is if you have a very secure, stable network, then you can, you can block all the ports and then open up the specific ports that you want opened and everybody will be hunky-dory. The thing is, in the modern world where everybody wants to use everything, uh, doing a really restrictive firewall can really cause problems, you know, because it will block instant messenger, it'll block Skype, it'll block all of these weird services that you may not even be thinking about. So, so that's the thing with, with firewalls. We talked about port triggering, triggering, and that's all we talked about. Don't worry about it, basically. Uh, and then uh, we talked about logs. Like I say, the, these guys, these, these, uh, these routers uh, can log uh, problems that they run into. Uh, a lot of times, like I say, they're turned off by default, so make sure you turn them on, especially when you're new, so that when you have problems, I mean, it's really simple. You just go into the log file and go, oh, port XYZ was blocked. I just need to open port, whatever. The other thing to remember is that these little routers uh, have their own little operating systems on them, some co sometimes called firmware or iOS. Uh, basically, you know, if you're having problems with your router, go out and see if there's a new upgrade. A lot of times there'll be a new upgrade, you just upgrade uh, the little operating system in there and everything works like new. Uh, it's about that simple. Uh, then we went into the examples. Uh, I showed you uh, the DMZ, uh, you know, how to, how to configure that and then how to, how to share uh, internet connections. Basically, um, with these routers, it's kind of one of those things like you just have to get a feel for, for why you need multiple routers. Um, the more you understand about networking and the more you understand about your client's needs, the more useful and the, the more ideas you'll have about how to use routers to make things more secure, to make things better for your client. When you first start out, you know, just start with one, one router and play with that. And then, then you might try the whole DMZ routine. And then you, you might try multiple, you know, different stuff. Uh, basically, you know, using routers is as much art as it is science. You know, what's, what do you think is going to make your, your network more secure? What, is you, what do you think will make your network more stable? And then you build an architecture around that. So that's basically all there is to understanding Soho uh, routers. Like I say, uh, this class, I did not go in and show you on the computer how to configure all this because again, most of these, uh, the, the routers use a GUI, a graphic interface, and they're all different. So if I showed you this Linksys interface, it will be different than a Netgear interface. It'll be different than a Juniper Net interface. It'll be different than, than any other interface. Basically, these are just overall ideas. Now that you understand that, you can log into your router and, and start playing with this stuff. As with everything, uh, you know, this stuff is not complicated. You've just got to play with it. You've just got to be willing to break a few things. So, you know, play with your network at home, you know, get a web server online at home. When you understand how to do that, then you can, you, you can go to your clients and it's, it's, it's pretty simple. So, uh, so that's really all there is to it. Uh, as always, I'm Eli, the computer guy here for Everyman IT. I really enjoy uh, teaching these classes for you guys and look forward to seeing you at the next one.